Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chevelle. It's Monday morning, November 6th today. And we are reading from the Gospel of St. Luke. I hope everybody's having a good start to their week. Huh? <laughs> Mia, it's getting colder here in California. Good morning, Brandon. Why are you not in school? <laughs> Everybody's greeting you. Or are you at school already? Anyway, let's read the gospel for today. From the gospel of St. Luke, chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. On the Sabbath, Jesus went to dine at home, at the home of one of the leading Pharisees. He said to the host who invited him, When you hold a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or sisters or your relatives or your wealthy neighbors in case they may invite you back and you have repayment. Rather, when you hold a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Blessed indeed will you be because of their inability to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So our Lord gives us here a very strict standard of what? A standard of service. Right? He is saying here, of course, he's using a banquet as, a, as an analogy, a form of analogy to, to help us understand a, a very concrete lesson. And what is that? That when we do things for others... Let us do whatever that is, whatever that service is. Let's do it out of a sincere desire and intention to help, to serve. Let us not do it out of selfishness just so that we will gain something back in return. Just so that we may... We may um, um, they may return the favor. Okay, it is the most selfless act that we could uh, what we could do is to serve others unconditionally, to do things for them without expecting anything in return. That is the most noble way of doing service to others, of helping others. Okay, not to expect anything in return. Okay? And our Lord demonstrates that with a very concrete example, such as that of uh, hosting a banquet. See? Um, because really, uh, the poor and uh, the homeless and these kinds of people, they have no way to host uh, a banquet for you back and invite you back, right? So that is a very, very concrete way our Lord is demonstrating that uh, lesson to us. So let us always have that uh, thing in mind. If we help others, let us help unconditionally without um, without thinking of um, a way by which they can repay us. Now folks, uh, that's as far as the gospel today is concerned, but I would like us to continue talking about the last things. We're in the month of November, so there are still a few uh, uh, lessons we could learn about the uh, last things. Right? And today I want to talk uh, specifically about the particular judgment the particular judgment so what happens immediately after death right? the other day we were talking about death and how we should not be afraid of death and how we could um, we could always practice uh, uh, not being afraid of death right and what would make us always be uh, prepared for death so today, let's talk specifically about what happens at the point of death. When death occurs, what happens? Okay. The soul leaves the body. Right? Philosophically and theologically, what death means is that the soul is, uh, at that point of death, the soul is unable, is not able anymore to work with the body. 
it is not able anymore to inform the body, to work with the body. Uh, maybe the body has, has uh, reached its ultimate limit, its functionality, its, uh, its uh, ability to perform the functions, the bodily functions that it is made to do. Okay? And as a consequence of that, the soul has to leave that body. Okay? It, has to, it has to leave the body. Uh, and, and it's at that point where death occurs. Okay? It is at that point that death occurs. And as soon as, that, as the soul departs from that body, what happens? The soul confronts Jesus. The soul will be in the presence of Jesus somehow. Okay? Somehow, we're not, we are not clear about how that happens, but somehow the soul um, faces the judgment seat of Jesus and is going to be judged. That is what we call the particular judgment. Particular because it pertains only to you, you as an individual. Okay? It is particular to you, specific to you. And let's read about what the Catechism tells us about the particular judgment. It says, um, The Church affirms that each will be rewarded immediately after death. Okay? The reward is immediate after death. In accordance with His works and faith. In accordance with how we live our lives. Okay? What we did in our life and how we lived our faith. So in accordance with our faith and works, those are the, 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 the matter that we will be judged on and judged about. Okay? Basically, if you cut it down, it is whether you did good or did bad. Okay? It all depends on what you did in life. And more specifically, if we're talking about good and bad, we're talking about how well you live the virtues, which is the good side, and the bad side would be what? Vice or worse than vice would be sin. See? See? So if you don't, that is why if you don't take care of the virtues, you might want to put that off for now. Uh, if you don't take care of the virtues, they f you fall into vice. Okay? The opposite of virtue is vice. And if the vice worsens, it becomes sin. Okay? So there is a graduation from doing a simple good act to doing it as a virtue because it becomes a good habit in you. And on the opposite side of the equation, once in a while you might fall into vice, but, you know, they can be small things. But if you don't cure the vice soon enough, those things will become bigger and bigger sins. Okay? So that is what we're going to be judged on. Okay? Did we live the virtues well or did we fall into vice and sin? Okay? And then if we are also going to be judged on our faith. On our faith how much did we really live up to that faith that we have been gifted with in baptism See? in baptism we receive the gift of faith how did we make it grow how did we make it flourish all throughout our life how did we really express our faith in God in the everyday occurrences of our lives because that is where we express that faith we don't express faith only when we go to church we express faith every day in everything that happens to us all throughout the day. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Now let's continue reading in the, in the, the, the Catechism. Each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of death in a particular judgment that refers his life to Christ. See, that refers his life to to Christ. In other words, what does that mean? What that means is that the model is Jesus Christ, right? Remember how he kept inviting us, come follow me. I am the way. 
the truth, and the life. In other words, you model your life after mine. I am the example. They come, follow me. You are my disciple. If you say you are my disciple, you should be imitating my life. That is why the reference point, the standard of the virtues that we should have lived is no less than Jesus Christ. So at our particular judgment, that's how our Lord is going to judge us, as the Catechism says. The particular judgment that refers his life, meaning our life, to that of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that Christ is our model. How well are we emulating and practicing and imitating the virtues of Jesus Christ? How are we becoming more and more Christ-like in this life? Okay. Now, what happens? Well, depending on how much we had modeled after Jesus' life, we either enter into the blessedness of heaven or, well, directly, immediately, or we enter it a little later after a time of purification. And that is where purgatory comes in. Or, the third option still is, we also immediately merit everlasting damnation. Everlasting damnation. That is dreadful. And that is, that, is what, that is what we all fear might happen, right? That is why we strive to be good apostles, good disciples of Jesus Christ. Because if not, well, we will merit uh, eternal damnation. Okay, what more? Uh, now, that is what particular judgment is all about. Now, but... At the end of all time, at the end of the world, there's also going to be the general judgment. The general judgment. What does the church say about the general judgment? Let's read about it. The resurrection of all the dead, okay, of both the just and the unjust, of those who are already uh, in heaven or those in purgatory and those who are in hell. They, we will all resurrect. We will all come back to life. Our mortal bodies will rise from their graves. Okay? will rise from their graves. And by the way, just parenthetically, this is this is where uh, this is where uh, the church um, um, uh, prefers prefers that we bury our dead, okay? because of this faith in the resurrection uh, at the end of the world. Now, of course, the church also allows cremation for uh, some specific uh, uh, reasons and with certain conditions. Uh, the church also allows uh, immediate cremation. But just to remind you folks, the church does not allow us to be uh, scattering the ashes or partitioning the ashes. Eh? So this habit of some people, uh, it has happened, it is happening, you know, of scattering the ashes in the ocean or in a river or wherever it is. <laughs> Or uh, they partition the ashes of the dead. Okay, you have some part of this and, they, and then part of it goes to the widow or the widower and the others go to the children. Or sometimes some other people, yeah, some other people, they put it into jewelry. They put it in their rings or in their necklaces or whatever it is to preserve. You know? Okay, all of those things are not uh, good practices and are not sanctioned by the church uh, because of the belief in the resurrection. Okay, so we will all resurrect at the end of the world. And our Lord will gather us, like, like He has already said in the Gospels, right? He will put the sheep on the right side, on one side, and all the uh, goats on the other side. Or He will put the, you know, that's a, that's a metaphor to say, the good guys here, the bad guys there. And everybody will see, everybody will know, everybody will be aware of what we have done all throughout our lives. Right? There's going to be a, a review of, you know, who goes here, who goes there. Okay? Now, of course, only the Father knows the final hour. Only He determines the moment of its coming. So nobody knows. Then, through His Son, Jesus Christ, He will pronounce um, the final word on all history. Okay? We shall know the ultimate meaning of the whole work of creation and of the entire economy of salvation and understand the marvelous ways by which His providence led everything towards its final end. So, 
by the time of the last judgment, there is where we are going to have a clarity. You see, the clear understanding of the reasons for everything. The reasons why things have happened the way they have happened. We will understand why God allowed certain things to happen in our lives and in the lives of others and in the entire world from beginning to end. Okay? There is where we're going to have a very good idea about what has happened from creation, from the time of creation all the way down to the life of the last baby. Whoever, uh, whoever he is will be born on earth. We will all understand it with complete clarity. Okay? And it's reserved for the last judgment. The last judgment will reveal that God's justice triumphs over all the injustices committed by his creatures. And that God's love is stronger than death. God's love is stronger than death. The message of the last judgment calls men to conversion while God is still giving them the acceptable time. And when is that acceptable time? Now, now Sophia, right? Now. Now God is giving all of us the time, <laughs> the right time to prepare, not only for the final judgment, but to prepare for our particular judgment, to prepare to be accepted in the company of God. So let us not waste this time. Let us not waste this opportunity. Plenty of people squander their lives. And they are falsely thinking, Oh, anyway, before I die, I can go to confession. I can be forgiven from all my sins. I can go to confession and wash off everything. And hopefully God is going to bring me to heaven. That's presumption. That's the sin of presumption. Okay? That is the sin of presumption. Remember that, well, we are given all this time to be able to prepare properly for that final uh, reckoning at the time of death. Let us not waste this time. Let us not waste our time. And you know what will help? What will help is that practice that we do every night before we go to bed. What is that practice? Very good, Mia. The examination of conscience. Where we, every night, just before we go to bed, we think about the good things we did. We think about the bad things we did. What did I commit sin not today? Or <laughs> infractions or uh, uh, um, um, uh, imperfections. What can I do better tomorrow? Where can I improve tomorrow? Right? What virtue can I practice better tomorrow? So the examination of conscience, folks, is a very, very good practice which we can all do. It's very simple. It takes three minutes of our time, five minutes maybe maximum. Well, you know, uh, use that as an opportunity to, to check ourselves every day, every day, every day. That's a good uh, way by which we can put ourselves in check and resolve to do better the following day. Okay? Resolve to do better the following day. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, <laughs> that's it for us, folks. Have a good day, everybody. We're off to Mass. And by the way, just as a reminder, you still have, to, uh, you still have up to the 8th of November to pray for the souls in purgatory in a cemetery. Okay? Uh, and that way you gain plenary indulgence for the dead. Not for ourselves, though, but for the dead. And let's do that act of charity. Let's do that act of charity for, for our departed brethren. Okay, that's it. Have a good day, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Hi, Tita Ann. Ann is here on, on the call today. Bye-bye <laughs> and good night to you there. Okay, see you. Bye. Bye.